Hello everyone and welcome to blog number four where we will be discussing reason. First we're going to talk about a letter of Sir Isaac Newton and then the satire against reason and mankind, then Oronoko and finally Rape of the Lock. We'll discuss how each four of these has to do with reason and how reason has to do with each four of these. So sit back, relax, and enjoy reason. The first work that we're going to talk about is a letter of Mr. Isaac Newton, which talks about his new theories of light and color. It started with his first experiment of sending light through a prism, which broke it into various colors in a semicircle. He examined the length of the rays and noticed that they were five times the breadth, which puzzled him. He went on to perform the experiment crucis, which led him to discover new properties of light and color. He set up a prism next to a window. When the light went through it, it broke into various colors. He also set up a board with a hole in it that isolated a single color for experimentation. By doing this, he discovered several new properties, including the origin of colors. Uh, the first of these dispelled the notion that color was a qualification of light. Instead, they are original and conate properties. Isn't that fascinating? Now, all this scientific mumbo jumbo might be interesting to some people, but for us as English majors, we have to ask the all-important question, so what? This may best be exemplified with Newton's last statement, I shall not mingle conjectures with certainties. This experiment illustrates the use of reason in the 18th century. Newton took previously concrete ideas and challenged them with his experiments. By so doing, he learned what was actually true, which was often different from what the previous notions suggested. For example, as you can see here, people said, this is how it is. But instead of accepting that, Newton said, I'm going to challenge this. So he did. Basically, Newton engaged in the process of thinking. He did not accept the world at face value, but instead used his reasoning to discover the truth in the world. Next up is a satire against reason and mankind by John Wilmot, second Earl of Rochester. Wilmot, or Rochester as he is more commonly referred to, was by all accounts extravagant, wild, and prone to drunkenness. His works are known for their extreme satire, and a satire against reason and mankind fits that description to a T. Rochester actually published this poem both as a satire against reason and mankind and a satyr against reason and mankind. Now, a satire is a literary work holding up human vices and follies to ridicule and scorn. But a satyr is a creature from Greek mythology that's part man and part goat. Which makes the speaker of this poem, being a satyr, cleverly qualified to say things like, I'd be a dog, a monkey, or a bear, or anything but that vain animal. That vain animal being man. So basically, the satyr spends the first half of the poem attacking reason. Uh, that's a satyr. He says that reason, the, the reason that mankind uses is often wrong and goes against instinct and the five senses. He thinks that all of the philosophers are going to feel pretty stupid when they're dead and realize that they were wrong. And then he goes on for a bit until a clergyman stops him and tries to defend reason. The clergyman's like, dude, what's your problem? We're figuring out the universe and stuff. And the satyr's like, fool, all you're doing is dumbing it down so that you and each heavy sot can pierce the limits of the boundless universe. And then he says that philosophers retire to think because they have not to do, and he compares them to Diogenes, a Greek philosopher who begged for a living and slept in a tub in the street. So by comparing all philosophers and re reasoners to Diogenes, the satyr is saying that they're all wasting their lives just sitting around and thinking about life when they could actually be living. The second half of the poem is where the satyr describes the ways in which reason ruins man and makes him less than beast. Beast kills for necessity. Humans kill for money, love, and power. Man makes a fuss over truly stupid things like stolen locks of hair and the rape of the lock. Men are cowards. Men are dishonest. Men betray each other. In the world of man, you can either take advantage or be taken advantage of. This poem can be pretty confusing, but arguably the most confusing thing of all is the last line of the poem, man differs more from man than man from beast. Um, which man? Which man is more different from which man, and which man is similar to a beast? Is it a true and humble man that differs from a man of reason? And which man is closer to a beast, the humble man or the other man? If these thoughts aren't puzzling enough, think on this. 
A satire against reason and mankind is a witty and philosophical poem that argues against wit and philosophy. Yeah. There's some good, never-ending confusion that's sure to make your head explode. It's also a pretty fun spot to say the end. This is the story of Oronoko, or the royal slave. And this is Oronoko. He's black and ripped. And this is the love interest of Oronoko. She's so hot. And her name's Imoinda. And this is the king of the story. He is actually the grandfather of Oronoko. He is extremely old. And he also really, really likes the ladies. Ow! Ow! One day, the king saw the beautiful Imoinda. Ow! and decided to use his kingly power to make her one of his wives. He gave her the royal veil, the symbol of his mandate, and Imoinda wasn't thrilled. She was taken away from her true love until Oronoko and his buddy decided to sneak in to see her. The king wasn't thrilled. Nothing happened. We were just talking. Slave! Yo, Oro, you know your girly friend Imoinda? Yeah? Yeah, she's a sl- er, uh, she's dead. Sorry. Oh no. Well, at least it's better than being a slave. <laughs> yeah, right. Stella! Imoinda! After two days of mourning and an epic battle, a French-looking Englishman arrived on shore and made her proposal. Hey, let's trade slaves for gold. All right. The Englishman invited Oronoko and his men to drink and dine on his ship, trusting the word of the white man, Oronoko consented. After getting them drunk, the Englishmen enslaved the Africans and shackled them. In protest, they refused to eat, and were in danger of starving to death. The Englishmen promised their freedom if they would eat to preserve their health. The Englishmen lied. Again. Having been deceived twice already, Oronoko declares, Farewell, sir. Tis worth my suffering to gain so true a knowledge, both of you and your gods by whom you swear. Oh, burn! Now this idea of knowledge, we see that Oronoko gains a knowledge of the white man, and more importantly, his inability to be trusted. He doesn't trust the white man's sense nor his reason. In fact, the Indians that they later meet don't even know if the white men have sense or reason, so it appears that this dilemma is equal between all the races. For Oronoko, honor is the first principle in nature that was to be obeyed, and therefore it served as the basis for all of his reasoning. And this didn't work out for the white men. Now, according to Wilmont, honesty is against all common sense. Men must be knaves, tis their own defense. Now, interestingly, in this story, the white men reason that they must be knaves, tis their own defense. Otherwise, they'd end up like Oronoko, who, having been deceived again and again and again, was finally sentenced to die. Oronoko only asked for a pipe as he was being executed and didn't make a sound as they cut off his ear, his nose, and his arm. We can only imagine what he was thinking. It is but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off! No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? I've had worse. You liar! Come on, you pansy, I'll bite your leg off! Unfortunately, Oronoko succumbed to his wounds and died. Here we see the end result of the only truth told by a white man, who apparently have no real sense nor reason. All right, and now finally on to The Rape of the Lock. Yeah, written by Alexander Pope. Ready, PG-13. Now, Alexander Pope called this poem a heroic poem. Well, that's not actually true. He called it a, a comedy. Well, actually, that's not really true either. He called it a heroic comedy. And it is based on a true story. Now then, this story goes a little something like this. Two prominent Catholic families had a falling out when, in 1711, a robber named Lord Petri decided to go over to Arabella Farmer and snip off a curl of her hair. This was to the indignation of both Arabella and all her relatives. This event was taken way too seriously and led to an estrangement between the two families. A friend, John Carell, told Alexander Pope about it in the hopes that Pope would be able to make a reconciliation between the two families. Now, this is Pope, uh, Alexander Pope, and when he first heard about this, the first thought he had was, these people are idiots. And then he had the thought that he should write a satire about it. Yeah, you know, 
a satire. We talked earlier about John Wilmont's A Satire Against Reason and Mankind, in which Wilmont lays a smackdown on false reasoning and tells off human beings as a bunch of evil, depraved, saddest creatures that are less than animals. Yet, anyway, moving on, this reasoning that he fights against, and this reason that he fights against, is the exact same type of reason reasoning that Pope fights against. The central theme of The Rape of the Lock is the fuss that high society makes over trifling matters. For example, take these two good-looking people right here. All they care about is their outward appearance, a clear lack of reason. You're looking pretty good, baby. Oh, oh, you are too, hot stuff. <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, to prove this point, Pope compares small and trivial things to big and important things. Uh, by treating small incidents as matters of great importance, their inconsequence is made obvious, which pokes fun at the common reason of the day. For example, a simple game of playing cards turns into a huge heroic battle, and the traditional epic journey to the underworld or other important places is parodied as a visit to the Cave of the Spleen so that the gnome Umbriel can bring back a bag of sighs, griefs, and tears. So, the climax of the story comes when the Baron finally does cut off a lock of Belinda's hair. And when that happens, she's pretty darn upset about it. But, you know, it's okay, because the lock of hair is memorialized and turned into a constellation. So anyway, the Baron doesn't care, and Belinda's so angry she won't listen to the sound advice of Clarissa, who gives really good advice. Now, where's the reason in that? None. They put... Ver looks over virtue every time. So what Pope's satire does is pokes fun at the wrong reasoning. So, just an overview. The poem is based on actual events. Pope hears about it and doesn't like this whole making a huge deal out of nothing business, so he decides to write. Three versions of The Rape of the Lock later, and you get today's version of the satire that pokes fun at the reasoning of the higher class, which says that looks are the most important thing, even higher than virtue. And that, my friends, is our presentation for the day. I hope you've enjoyed it, and this is the end of our presentation.